We have two scripture readings for today. First comes from Exodus chapter 3, verse 8. Exodus chapter 3, verse 8. Follow as I read. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Our second verse comes from Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 26. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. This is the word of God. Thank you, choir, for that blessed song. And thank you all for coming out today. I'm Evangelist Eric. Hello. Today, uh, we have two messages today. And so I'm very honored to be before you today, and I pray that you are blessed by this message. And as we read in our Exodus chapter 3, our main scripture for today, Exodus chapter 3, verses 8, we see that God um, went down to Egypt and brought his people up out of a land that they were in bondage in, and he promised them a good and spacious land. So as we uh, have studied the history of redemption, we know that uh, God's people were in bondage, and God promised that he would deliver them. So after the ten plagues and the exodus, God made a pathway for them to journey into the wilderness and into the land of Canaan. And God promised the land of Canaan to Abraham first, and then to Isaac, and then to Jacob. So today, for a short while, I want to talk about the characteristics of the land of Canaan and the redemptive, history, uh, the redemptive historical meaning of the land of Canaan. So first, Canaan is a place that God has selected. This is what the Bible tells us. Canaan is a place that God has elected. And through the prophet Ezekiel, God taught the later generations that Canaan, the land given to them by God, was the land that God has selected. If we can put a verse up on the screen, Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 6. It says, on that day I swore to them to bring them out from the land of Egypt into a land that I had selected for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. So as we can see from this scripture verse, Canaan was not some land that they just kind of fell into, but the land of Canaan was promised and it was selected by God. And in the original Hebrew language, the word select or selected is tur. If we can pick that up on the board, the word selected is in, in the Hebrew language is tur, meaning to find, to ex, to discover, or to explore. So, what does this teach us? This teaches us that someone has to go before the people to seek out a place, to find a place, and to discover a place. So, to select some, that means a person had to go before the people to do this, right? So, in the Bible. It says this, that the word Torah is also used to describe the ark of God journeying in front of the Israelites to seek out a resting place before them. If we look at Numbers chapter 10, verses 33, it says, Thus they set out from the mount of the Lord three days journey with the ark of the covenant of the Lord journeying in front of them for three days to seek out a resting place for them. See? So the ark of God, which is symbolic of Christ, right, set out before the people to seek out a resting place. And this is what our God does for us, right? So it's a place that God himself has selected. He goes out before his people, and he seeks a place for us. And that's something to be, you know, joyous about, right? We don't have to seek out this place, but God has already sought out this place, this precious land for us, right? Also... The Bible, in the Bible, it says that this word tour also describes um, God who goes before to seek out a place for them to encamp. If we look at Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 32 to 33. Next slide. <laughs> Next one. There you go. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 32 to 33 says, But for all this you did not trust the Lord your God, who goes before you on your way, to seek out a place for you to encamp in fire by night and cloud by day to show you the way in which you should go. See, 
So it is God who shows us the way to go, right? We, don't, we can't get there to this promised land on our own, but God who goes before us and seeks out a place for us to encamp, he shows us the way to go. And this is what we see in the Bible today. So as you can see, uh, Canaan, which is heaven for us, the kingdom of God, is a place that God has selected for us. But not only that, for the Bible declares that heaven, the kingdom of God, is a place God prepared before the ages. So not only did he seek out this place, but he prepared this place before the ages. A place that he himself prepared for you and me from the foundation of the world. So as children of God, God has prepared this place, this heavenly place for us from the foundations of the world, before the ages. Let's look at Matthew chapter 25, verses um, 34. It says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So again, as Christians, as saints today, we have a place that God has prepared for us from the foundation of the world. So this is something that we should be, um, you know, happy about. This is something that we should rejoice. And this place of Canaan, this land of Canaan, which is heaven, right, this should be the only land that we desire, right? The only land that we should desire. Um, I hear people say they want to go to America, to other places, exotic places like Japan and, and all these places around the world. But as for us, what should be our joy and desire? The, heart, the land of Canaan, right? Heaven. This should be the desire in our hearts, and this should be the place that we should be able to uh, want to find and seek, for God has prepared this place for us. So point number two. Not only is the land of Canaan is a place that God has selected for us, the land of Canaan is a good and spacious land, a good and spacious land. As we read in our main text today in Exodus chapter 3, verse 8, it says, So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. So it says here first that this land is a good land, right? So what does this mean, that Canaan is a good land? What does this mean? It means this. Let's go to Exodus chapter 20, verse 6. Exodus chapter 20, verse 6. There we go. On that day I swore to them to bring them out from the land of Egypt into a land that I had selected for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all land. See? So this is a good and spacious land, but this, this land is a glorious land, right? Not just any place, but a glorious land. Glory of all lands. So out of all the lands and all the earth, right, this place that God has selected for us is the glory of all lands. And this is where we want to be as saints of God in the end times. This is where we should be, okay? So again, therefore, the Canaan, Canaan the kingdom of God, is the most beautiful place in the world, the most beautiful world in the world, right? This is what God has selected for us, and this is what should be in our heart. This is the land that we should desire in these end times. And this, this place that God has chosen for us, I believe that everyone here today have been selected to um, go to this land in the end times. So I believe as we study the word of God, this is the place that we will end up with our, our Father who is in heaven for eternity. So also, it says, also according to 3.8, Canaan is a spacious land. Okay, the word spacious, if we could put that on the board, the word spacious in Hebrew is Rahab, meaning vast or big, okay? So it's a spacious land, okay? And this word is derived from Rahab. Therefore, this teaches us today that Canaan is called a spacious land because of what? God's presence. God's presence is in the land of Canaan. So in this land that God has selected, in this land that God has given to us, God is present there. God is present. So again... This land that God has given to us today, this spacious land, this good land, this is the land that we should desire. Why? Because God is present there. And the Bible says that our God is eternal, right? 
So we serve an almighty God. He is very large and vast. And so in this land that we are going to is where our God dwells. Amen? So what is the redemptive historical meaning of the land of Canaan? What is the redemptive historical meaning of the land of Canaan? God, who led the Israelites into the land of Canaan and gave the land of their possession, foreshadows God's kingdom that will surely be realized through the second coming of Christ. It will be realized through the second coming of Christ. Let us look at Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. It says, Then in that day the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal for, his pe- for the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. Okay? So what does this mean? What this means is that the nations will repent and return at the coming of the Messiah, so that his kingdom will be glorified. Also, the Apostle Paul explained that this prophecy had been fulfilled in Jesus Christ and that Jesus Christ is the root of Jesse, the one and only hope for the nations. And you can reference Romans chapter 15, verse 12 for this. So Jesus Christ is the root of Jesse, right? Also in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 16, it says the following. And there would be a highway from Assyria for the remnant of his people who would be left just as there was for Israel in the day that they came up out of the land of Egypt. So what does this mean? When God delivered his people out of Egypt, he parted the Red Sea, right? And he made this pathway for them to go through the Red Sea on dry land. And then they went into the wilderness into the land of Canaan. Likewise, today, our Father has given us the history of redemption. And through the history of redemption, God has opened up a pathway for us as well, right? He's opened up a pathway for us to go into the wilderness, which we're in now, our church life, and then into, the, um, into Canaan, which is the kingdom of God. So it is through the history of redemption that God has opened up this pathway for us. God has given us this special word that we must study and that we must study with zeal. Because before that, we, you know, we, we've had all these other doubts and teachings, and we were bound by the world. But through the history of redemption, God has opened up the pathway for us now. And I believe that the more we study the history of redemption, the more we can see our way through. Our senior pastor used to say that um, through the history of redemption, through the proclamation of the history of redemption, that nations will come singing and dancing. And I believe that through that word, many people will come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that is happening right now today. Amen? So I believe that through the history of redemption, we have to be able to teach and proclaim the word of God so that they can have, those who are lost can have that pathway to the land of Canaan. And I believe when we do that, then we will be able to fill these pews here in Shiloh. I believe that it will be an overflowing when we really um, trust in God and go out and proclaim the word of God. Amen? So, likewise today, we must be able to study the history of redemption, and we, may be, we must be able to march forward to that new heaven and new earth that is coming. Okay? Um, I don't think I have a slide for this, but Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 4. I'll read this for you. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 4. Revelations chapter 21, verses 1 to 4, it says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. And he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. See? So here in the book of Revelation, it says that God himself will come and dwell with his people. The tabernacle will come and dwell with his people. And I believe that God is dwelling with us today. Amen? So I believe that as we continue to study the word of God, the history of redemption, I pray that as we study Let us go out with the spirit of evangelism, 
to all the world that we may be able to bring those who are lost, that we may be able, be able to be a light before all men to bring them to the house of God. And when we do that, then God's kingdom will what? Increase, grow, right? God's kingdom will increase. So I believe Shiloh is, is that place. Shiloh is, on the, is the point man in, the, in these end times, the point man. We're out there and we're supposed to go out there and proclaim the word of God that we may bring people in. And I believe that if we really truly believe that in our hearts, then I believe that we will see what our senior pastor prophesied uh, some time ago about the nations and all the people, God, coming forward. And I believe that's going to happen in our time. And I believe it's already happening now. Amen? So I pray that we can do that, and I pray that we can always be marching forward to the land of Canaan, the place that God has selected for us, the place that God has went out and camp, uh, went out and searched and sought for us, that he has prepared from the foundation of the world that we may be able to be with him eternally. Amen? So I pray that you are blessed by this message, and I pray that we as Shiloh and all those who have come, let us go out and proclaim the word of God. Amen? Amen. Um, so at this time, we're going to have our beloved evangelist, Jabez, come up with a second message. So please uh, pray for him as he comes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brother Eric. Hallelujah. So it was, it was mentioned earlier, it was read earlier by our elder at the beginning of the service, uh, but I'd like to turn once again to Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 26, and I'd like for us to be able to read that together. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 26. So if we can read this together, ready, begin. I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it will be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. And this is the word of God. Amen. So with the scripture reading from today, I'd like to share another short message entitled The Covenant and Redemptive History. So the topic of the covenant is something that not only here at Shiloh, and I'm sure not only in your respective departments, but every educator throughout all of church emphasizes the covenant uh, when it comes to understanding the word of God. And why is that? Why is the covenant so important, especially for redemptive history? If we look at the process of redemptive history, we begin with the creation. And then we move to the fall. And then we have the recovery. Why does redemptive history exist? Since the creation of man and the fall of man, our Father God wanted to be in communion with us again. But because we have sinned and because our Father God is perfect and holy, there is a separation between us. So in order for that separation to be bridged, in order for us and the Father to once again be in the same communion, that is why redemptive history exists. So redemptive history, we understand, is the process that allows us to go back to the Father. But every process needs something that drives it. See, just understanding these steps of redemptive history is not enough. We have to understand what is it that drives this process forward. And that we see is 
the covenant. And the thing about the covenant is it's not just a single word that talks about how God loves us or that talks about how God can unite us back together with him. But the covenant is actually a process that progresses in time. So when you start out, you start out knowing not very much, but then gradually, as time goes on, more and more aspects of the covenant are actually revealed. So the covenant becomes more detailed, and in being more detailed, it actually explains to us more about the love and the purpose of God. So the ultimate fulfillment of the covenant is who? Jesus Christ, right? So Jesus Christ is the final and ultimate manifestation of the covenant. So if we can understand the covenant, we can understand the process of how redemptive history moves forward, and ultimately, we can understand Jesus Christ himself. Why? Because in John chapter 17, when we understand Jesus... Through him, we know the Father, and we have eternal life. So if you look at Malachi chapter 2, verse 5, that looks like a 12, doesn't it? So Malachi chapter 2, verse 5, it says that the covenant is life and peace. So the purpose of the covenant is to give us Life and peace. So if you look at John chapter 14, verse 6, it says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. If you look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, it says that Jesus is our peace. So the purpose of the covenant is to give us life and peace. Jesus is the life. Jesus is the peace. So that's how we know that Jesus himself is the ultimate fulfillment of this covenant. So knowing that Jesus is the covenant is one thing, but then how do we understand the process of how Jesus came as the fulfillment of the covenant? How do we understand this process taking place through redemptive history? Redemptive history, as you know, covers much of the Old Testament, from Genesis to the Chronicles to the last prophet Malachi, all of this time before Jesus Christ in the B.C. years, all of this history, God is using it to proclaim how much he loves us, and it is through history that God shows us how we are redeemed. So looking at it from a redemptive historical perspective, how can we see the progress of this covenant? So first, let's look at the progression of the covenant in the Old Testament. Now remind me, for those of you who know, how many expressions of the covenant are there in the Old Testament after the fall? So I'm asking for a number. What's the popular number in the Bible? Seven. There are seven progressions of the covenant that are in the Old Testament. And the first one is the promise of the woman's seed. So after the fall of man, God punished Adam and Eve. God cursed them. But despite that curse, God gave them hope. He said that there will be a seed of the woman that will come, and this seed will crush the head of the serpent. We know that the serpent is the one that caused Adam and Eve to fall and disobey God by eating from the tree of knowledge. But this woman's seed will redeem them by actually crushing the head of the serpent. And we see this in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And who was this covenant given to? It was given to Adam and Eve. So if you look at the History of Redemption series, our founding pastor says that this promise of the woman's seed is the foundation of all the covenants that are expressed in the Bible. 
And this woman's seed shows us that the covenant is genealogical in nature. So we follow the genealogy, we follow through history how this covenant progresses. So what's the next step after the woman's seed? We have Noah, the Noahic covenant. And this is also called the covenant of the rainbow. So if you look at Genesis chapter 6, verse 18, it says that I will make my covenant with you. So this is God talking to Noah. I will make the covenant with you and your sons, your wife and your sons' wives. So we see that the covenant is now expanding to a family. So we go from the couple, Adam and Eve, and now the covenant is being expressed to a family. But then, if we look at Genesis chapter 9, verse 9, it says that this covenant is with you, your sons, your wife, your sons' wives, and your descendants. So not only does the covenant cover a couple, and not just a family, but also the descendants, the line of successors after the family. So then do we see how the covenant now has gotten a little bit bigger? How the covenant is now expanding through history? After Noah, we have the Abrahamic covenant. And of course, we know this covenant is made with Abraham. In the Old Testament, there are actually... There are actually seven covenants that were made with Abraham. We're not going to cover all of them, but if we look at Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, what does God say? God talks to Abraham and he says, leave your country, leave your relatives, leave your father's house to a land that I will show you. So God is promising Abraham that he's going to give him a land. It's a promised land. And then, furthermore, God says, I will bless you, and you will become a great nation. Now, Abraham, during his time, his family did not become a nation yet. But what we have is the promise of a nation. We have the promise of a nation. So if we look at Genesis chapter 15... Verse 5, and also verse 7. In verse 5, we see that Abraham is promised descendants. And in verse 7, we see that Abraham is promised the great land that he is witnessing. So through descendants and land, we see that these are the components of the covenant that Abraham had received. Because if you're going to become a nation, what do you need? You need people, and you need a land to call your own, right? You also need sovereignty, but we're gonna get, that in, uh, we're gonna get to that in a moment. So again, we have the couple Adam and Eve, but now we have a family through Noah, but then through Abraham we see that not just a family, not just the descendants, but there is the promise of a nation, and this is where the covenant is going to take place. God is looking for his people, his nation, to be born. And we see this promise being made through Abraham. And fourth, what is the next progression? It's through Moses, right? So we have the Mosaic Covenant, also called the Sinaitic Covenant because the law was given to them on Mount Sinai. So if you look at Exodus chapter 24, verses 7 through 8, we now have the great nation of Israel, 2.1 or so million people, and they've making the, they're making the journey into the Canaan land. But before they go in, God gives them the law. Moses takes God's law, he writes it all into a book, and he recites it to the people. And in Exodus chapter 24, verses 7 and 8, 
we see the people, after hearing the law, they said, we will obey the word of God. We will be his covenanted people. So they made sacrifices to the Lord. Moses takes the blood, he sprinkles it on the people, and he says, behold, the blood of the covenant. Now, what does blood represent? Blood represents the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, right? The blood that he shed. So now, for this nation of God that has now been formed, the promises that were made to Abraham are now being fulfilled through the people of Israel. Blood is sprinkled on them. This foreshadows the blood of Jesus Christ that's going to save all of us from sin so that we can all become God's covenanted nation. Do you believe this? Amen, right? So we go from a couple, we go to a family and descendants, the promise of a nation, and now we have the actual fulfillment of the nation itself through the Mosaic Covenant. And we, this we can see, can we see now how the covenant is progressing through history? How as time goes on, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, how more details of the covenant are being revealed. Now remember, as time goes on, we are getting closer and closer to Jesus Christ, right? So in the same way, as we're waiting for the second coming Christ to come again, as time goes on, more and more of the covenant is going to be revealed to us. How? Through the word. You see, this word of redemptive history explains all of the Bible. As time goes on, of course, we're going to learn more, right? So the more we learn, the closer we're going to draw to God, and the more um, closer, the closer we will come to actually consummating our relationship through the second coming. Amen? All right, so after Moses... We go from a couple all the way to a nation. How much bigger can we go from there, right? Another covenant was made with David through the Davidic covenant. And the content of this, we can see in 2 Samuel chapter 7. All of 2 Samuel chapter 7 contains the content of the Davidic covenant. But specifically, if we look at verse 16... It says that David's house, that David's kingdom, that David's throne will last forever, that it will be eternal. Now, how do we make this jump from a nation? What is the significance of David? What does he represent? There are many nations in this world, right? And there are many forms of government. We've got democracies, we've got republics, we've got communist regimes. But the thing with the Davidic covenant is it's talking about a kingdom. See, it's not just any nation that God makes his covenant with. But God is making his covenant with the nation that is a kingdom. So who is supposed to be our king? God is supposed to be our Lord and King, right? So not only do we become a covenanted people, but we recognize God and we know him as our Lord, we know him as our King, and this is represented through David. So let's follow the covenant process again. After sin, we have the woman's seed given to Adam and Eve. We have the promise of the rainbow made to a family and their descendants. Through the descendants, we have the promise that there's going to be a nation and a land flowing with milk and honey, as we had learned previously from Evangelist Eric. This promise of the nation is fulfilled through Moses with the actual nation. So they have now left Egypt and they're coming to settle into their land. Once they settle, this nation needs to develop and progress even further to recognize God as their king. And that is why through David we see that the nation of God is a kingdom. Now this is number five. The sixth and seventh covenants in the Old Testament are a little bit more abstract. They're not made to a specific person or to a specific family, but they further testify of how the covenant is fulfilled through Jesus Christ. So the sixth covenant after this 
is called the New Covenant. And this was prophesied through Jeremiah. So if we look at Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. It talks about how Israel had an old covenant, but they broke it. What's God talking about? They had the law of Moses. They had the statutes. They had the ordinances. They had the priesthood. They had the Sabbath. They had the festivals. But Israel as a nation, they could not keep the laws and statutes of God. So God said that the old covenant that Israel had made with them they broke it. They did not fulfill their obligations. But what did God say? He said, I will make a new covenant with them. My word will be in their hearts. Everyone will know me, and I will forgive their iniquity. This is the new covenant. And how is this fulfilled? If you go to Luke chapter 22, verse 20, what scene is this? This is the Last Supper. Jesus takes the bread, he breaks it, he gives it to the disciples, he says, this is my body. He takes the cup, pours out the wine, and he says, this is the blood of the new covenant. See, the new covenant is in Jesus' blood. See, the Mosaic covenant, Moses sprinkled the blood upon the people. And that blood represents the blood shed by Jesus Christ. So here, in the new covenant, Jesus says that this covenant is in my blood. See, it's not one where we follow rules. It's not one where we follow regulations or schedules. It's one where because of sin, Jesus died for us. We're the one that sinned. We're the ones that should have died. But it is through his blood, his blood that contains the new covenant, that we are saved. And when Jeremiah talks about this in the Old Testament, that's how it's prophesying about Jesus Christ in the New Testament. And then after... After the new covenant of Jeremiah, the seventh covenant of the Old Testament, we have what's called the peace covenant, also called the everlasting covenant. And this was prophesied through Ezekiel. And of course, this was our scripture reading today, Ezekiel chapter 37. Verse 26. So let me read that again. You can follow along. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them. See? Covenant of peace. It will be everlasting. I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. You see, God is going to dwell with his people forever. That is part of this covenant. Now, if you go to verse 24, Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 24, it says something interesting. My servant David will be king over them. They will all have one shepherd. They will walk in my ordinances and keep my statutes and observe them. So, in Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 24, we see David... Now, here's an interesting thing. David lived 500 years before Ezekiel, right? David reigned in Israel 500 years before Ezekiel made this prophecy. So when Ezekiel is saying that David will be king, is he talking about the David of the past who ruled in Israel? That's impossible, right? David's been sleeping for 500 years. But if you go back to the Davidic covenant, what did God say? God said that I will establish your son. Your descendant after you will be established forever. His throne, his house, his kingdom will be established forever. Now, at that time, he may have been talking about David's physical son, Solomon, but in truth, it's ultimately testifying of Jesus Christ himself. So if you look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, 
and also chapter 22, verse 42, it says that Jesus is the son of David. So when you're talking about the Davidic Messiah, you're talking about Jesus Christ. Even the Jews recognize that when the Messiah comes, he'll come as the son of David. So it is actually with the peace covenant and Ezekiel's mention of David that we go back full circle to the women's seed. Remember, the covenant of the women's seed is the foundation of every covenant in the Bible. So whether you're looking at Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, the new covenant, or the peace covenant, it's all related to the woman's seed. So how does this come back together? So turn with me to Psalm chapter 89, verses 3 and 4. Psalm chapter 89, verses 3 and 4. And let's read this together. Have we all found it? If you found it, say amen. Psalm chapter 89, verses 3 and 4. Let's read together. Ready, begin. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your seed forever and build up your throne to all generations. What does it say? I will establish your seed. Right? So with David, his seed will be established forever. And we have the woman's seed here. So in conclusion... If you look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, it says that the seed is Jesus Christ. If you look at Luke chapter 8, verse 11, it says that the seed is the Word. And if you look at John chapter 1, verse 1, it says that the Word is God. And in verse 14, that the Word became flesh and dwelt with men. In our opening verse today, it said that God's sanctuary will be in the midst of his people, and God will dwell with them. You see, the word came to us through Jesus Christ, and Jesus dwelt with us. So Jesus, as the word, as the seed, we can see once again how biblically he is the fulfillment of the covenant. Now, what are aspects of the covenant? The covenant is unilateral. See, after Adam and Eve sinned, there's nothing that they can do to save themselves. There's nothing that we can do to save ourselves. But the covenant works through God. He is the one that does everything. It is unilateral. First, first John chapter 4, verse 19 says that God loved us first, and that's why we love. The covenant of God is also sovereign. All the majesties of God, all the wonders of God... God himself has done it. And this we see in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 4. And also, the covenant of God is eternal. Psalm chapter 105, verse 8, it says that God has remembered his covenant forever. So God's covenant being unilateral, being sovereign, being eternal, this is the amazing gift that God has given to us. Now, all the covenants that we have looked at today, the woman's seed, Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, the new covenant, the peace covenant, theologically, these are covered under what's called the covenant of grace. Theologians call this the covenant of grace. Why? Because it's nothing that man does, but it's only through grace is this covenant performed. Does this covenant progress? So, with that in mind, let's conclude with Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 5. So let's all turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 5, and we will conclude for today. Have we all found it? Let's read it together. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Ready, begin. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, 
even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. See, Paul is writing to the Ephesians that it's not anything that we did, anything that we deserve, but because God loved us, because of his grace, we are saved. All the covenants that we looked at today are part of what we call the covenant of grace. So it is my hope and prayer that all of us, regardless of what we have done, regardless of our situation, regardless of our weaknesses, please have the faith, please have the assurance that it is not by our own strength, it is not by our own will that we are saved, but because of the grace of our almighty and all-powerful God, through the blood of Jesus Christ, we have our re eternal redemption and salvation through him, and let us proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to all the world. Amen? Amen. So let us conclude with prayer. Our merciful Father God, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you so much for your grace. By your mercies, once again, you've allowed us to gather here so that we can worship you by the proclaiming of your word. Father God, the prophet Hosea has said that the word that we receive, we must return them to you as sacrifices that's pleasing before you. Father God, we come to you now with a confession of our lips. Please take away from us our iniquity. Just as, Father God, through the new covenant in Jesus Christ, you have proclaimed the forgiveness of sins. You have proclaimed the washing away of our iniquities so that we can know you and draw closer to you. At this time, through your word of redemptive history, Father God, let us understand you more. And by understanding you through understanding the word, let us, Father God, have access to the eternal life which you so have foreordained for us since the beginning of creation. Father God, may this word of redemption be buried in the garden of our hearts. And may we bear for, bear for you the fruit of evangelism, bear for you the fruits of repentance, and bear for you, Father God, the fruits of redemptive history. We pray, Father God, that through us, through our families, through our nation, that we may become the covenanted kingdom of priests that are able to serve you, that love you, that can proclaim your light to all the world, so that through your word of redemptive history, we can proclaim the grace that we have through Jesus Christ and our eternal salvation. We give everything, Father God, into your hands, and with thankful hearts we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's give glory to our Father.